Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today's video is going to be my September-October book haul. Uh, I have slowed down a little bit on acquiring books, but not that much. Um, if you're curious about um, reading statistics and my book buying budget for the year, I have to do an update on that eventually, but I have now slightly exceeded the cap on my book buying for the year, which is not a terrible thing. It's not like I'm spending money I don't have, but I have, I have maxed out the book buying budget and I need to be more careful for the last couple months of the year. Um, but I'm actually going to start off with this book haul um, with the books that I requested for review. Um, I recently saw that the physical arcs of a couple of Tor.com novels novellas were available, and I wanted them so badly, I finally got up the guts to email <laughs> email them and ask if I could get some review copies. And they said yes, and sent me some things. So um, the two that I asked for are Miranda in Milan by Catherine Duckett, and The Haunting of Tramcar 15 by P. Jelly Clark. So Miranda in Milan, I saw this was coming in, what does it say? March of 2019, and I had to get it. So Miranda in Milan is not a retelling of The Tempest by Shakespeare, but it seems to be set after the events of that play. I should just read what it says on the back. Um, Debut author Catherine Duckett reimagines the consequences of Shakespeare's The Tempest, casting Miranda into a Milanese pit of vipers and building a queer love story that lifts off the page in whirlwinds of feeling. And it has a ton of um, praise on the back from a bunch of authors that I think very highly of. Um, but I think it has a beautiful cover. It sounds very interesting. I find that The Tempest by Shakespeare is one of the most intriguing plays I've ever read by him. I didn't completely understand it when I read it, but I thought it was gorgeous, and I'm really interested in reading um, a story that kind of riffs on the elements of that. So I'm really looking forward to this one. And then The Haunting of Tramcar 15. I read Clark's previous Tor.com novella, The Black God's Drums, a couple weeks ago and really enjoyed it. And then I saw that he has this next one coming out in February of 2019. And it's set in the same world and the same like alternate history fantasy version of Cairo as his short story or novelette called A Dead Gen in Cairo, which I read a couple years ago and really liked. I especially liked the feel and the setting of it. So, so yeah, it excited me a lot to know that there's another story set in that world. So this is what this one says. Cairo 1912, the case started simply enough for the Ministry of Alchemy, Enchantments, and Supernatural Entities. Handle a possessed tram car. Soon, however, Agent Hamid Nazar and his new partner, Agent Onsi Youssef, are exposed to a new side of Cairo, stirring with suffragettes, secret societies, and sentient automatons. It's a race against time to protect the city from an encroaching danger that crosses the line between the magical and the mundane. That sounds like my kind of thing. Hopefully it's not like a scary ghost type story with the haunting aspect of this, but more just, you know, fantasy and figuring out the magical stuff going on. So yes, that one. And then um, they sent me this, which is Middle Game by Sean and McGuire. So uh, let me read the back of this for the first time. Meet Roger. Skilled with words, languages come easily to him. He instinctively understands how the world works through the power of story. Meet Dodger, his twin. Numbers are her world, her obsession, her everything. All she understands, she does so through the power of math. Roger and Dodger aren't exactly human, though they don't realize it. They aren't exactly gods, either. Not entirely. Not yet. I think I'll stop there. Um, hey, language and math, gifted twins. Um, I think I'm sold on that one, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> All three of these are, of course, 2019 releases, and I will probably um, talk about them later, closer to the actual publication dates, uh, though I may have to jump in and read the novellas right away. We will see, because I'm really taken with all three of these. 
But now moving on to things that I have purchased for myself. I'll start off with the um, used paperbacks, as I don't have too much to say about any of these actually. Um, I have basically been using uh, book swap sites for the last two years and just getting nice cheap reading copies of things. So a couple of my wishlist items came up. I finally, finally got a copy of Sideshow by Sherry S. Tepper. This is the final book in the Arby series that begins with Grass and Raising the Stones. And I read a bit of the back. I don't want to like spoil things for the previous book, so I'm not going to really describe it that much. But this seems to also include the Hobbes Land Gods, which were very, very important in Raising the Stones. And I freaking love that book. It's my favorite book by Sherry Tepper. So I'm hoping that Sideshow is more like Raising the Stones and less like grass because I didn't really like grass. But yes, I have been trying to get a copy of this for quite a while now and I finally got one. And then I got another uh, Tepper book. This is The Family Tree and I haven't read anything about it. It's just by her, so I got a copy. Um, police officer Dora Henry is investigating the bizarre murders of three geneticists. Meanwhile, strange things are happening everywhere she turns. Weeds are becoming trees, trees are becoming forests. Overnight, a city is being transformed into a wild and verdant place. And strangest of all, Dora can somehow communicate with the rampaging flora. A potential civilization ending catastrophe is in the making. Uh, well, okay, it uses the magic word geneticists, and so if it's at all maybe kind of scientifically accurate, I might really like that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is not a title by Tepper I've ever heard anybody talk about. Um, I just didn't have it at the library, so I put it on a wish list and I got a copy. And much in the same vein, I'm just sort of collecting copies of the books to read eventually, but I don't know that much about them. I got Sethra Lovode by Stephen Bruce. This is another one of the books in his Kavren Romances series, which is set in the same Dragaran Empire world that his other series, the Vlad Tato series, is set in, but it's set in a different time period. Some similar characters, though, like the character Sethra Lavode, there are two women with that name. One of them is a sorceress, one of them is a warrior. Seeing as there's a lady with the sword on the cover, I'm gonna guess this is Sethra Lovode, the younger, who's the warrior. But yeah, I have one more book to collect in this series and then I'll have the complete set and we'll probably start reading them at that point. And uh, now we move into the story of the fantasy masterworks. Um, so in uh, late September, I realized that I had most of the um, fantasy masterworks from the Golantz line, and the ones that I had yet to get and um, buy from Book Depository, some of them started to not be available for purchase there anymore, and I got a bit worried about it. So basically, I bit the bullet and I bought all of the remaining fantasy masterworks that I needed to get and read, um, and I got them all except for two. Um, one of them is The Anvil of Ice by uh, Michael Scott Rowan. This is the first book in the Winter of the World series. Supposedly it's in the Fantasy Masterworks line, but when I tried to buy a used copy, they sent me this obviously not the right edition <laughs> version, but I'd never heard of this book before. Um, I've heard of Rowan's name for whatever reason. Um, and the, honestly, this sounds like a very typical um, hero's journey 1980s fantasy novel from the very short description on the back, including the fact that it has a quote from Roger Zelazny on the back. I swear, he like blurbed everything from the 80s and 90s. Um, so it says, It is the year before yesteryear, and the world is yet young. The forests are filled with creatures half divine, and the seas with raiders more demon than human. Into this world that was forgotten before ours was born, where the great ice is gathering for a final assault, comes an unlikely hero, a boy apprenticed to the lost magics of metal and fire. The good news, it sounds like the boy isn't a farm boy, he's probably more of like a blacksmith's apprentice, but that sounds a little bit um, cliche and traditional. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I am actually curious about this one because I've never heard of it before and who knows, it could be really amazing. I suppose there's a reason why it was um, included in the Fantasy Masterworks lineup. 
And then I have the others, which I did get in the editions that I am collecting. So let's start with the Tim Powers ones. Um, in my previous book haul back in August, I hauled Earthquake Weather by Tim Powers, and that turned out to be the third book in the series, and the first two are also in this Masterworks line. So we have Last Call and Expiration Date. I don't remember exactly what order they go into, um, but I will read the stuff on the back here because this sounds very interesting. So um, Last Call, this is what it says. 20 years ago, Scott Crane abandoned his career as a professional poker player and went into hiding after a weird high-stakes game played with tarot cards. Um, but now the cards and the supernatural powers behind them have found him again. Crane's father killed gangster Bugsy Siegel in 1948 to become the Fisher King, and to keep that power he is determined to kill his son. Now Scott Crane must take up the cards again for one last poker duel, and the stakes are the highest he's ever played for. His soul. Uh, so I'm actually not intrigued by the poker playing stuff at all, so I hope that I don't have to like poker in order to enjoy the story, but it sounds like it's going to be delightfully weird. And then expiration date. Um, this says... After 12-year-old Kut Pargana's parents are murdered, he finds himself a fugitive in the darkest corners of L.A., pursued by denizens of a dark underworld who want what Kuti's parents have been hiding for 40 years. The ghost of Thomas Edison contained in a bust of Dante. WTF, man. <laughs> But Cootie has broken the bust and inhaled the ghost and is now haunted by Edison himself. This is great. Um, together they must learn the harsh rules of the occult world they've been thrust into and find a way to save Cootie's life and free Edison's ghost from his earthly purgatory. <laughs> I think this is the second book, but I kind of want to start reading that right away. So yeah, um, I have heard great things about Tim Powers. I've just never actually read any of his books, and now I own four of them, I think, so I should, you know, read one of them. Um, next, I have The Dragon Grial by Lucia Shepard. I know Shepard's name, it comes up all the time, but I'd never heard of The Dragon Grial before. But this is not a novel, it's a collection of stories, I suppose, about the dragon. So it just says, this is the definitive tale of the Dragon Grial, a beast so immense its body forms part of the landscape. And yeah, I find the cover of this one to be particularly appealing. I like the uh, blue-gray uh, scheme going on here. The illustration here is by Chao Oliveira, or however you pronounce that, so yeah, that's attractive. <laughs> and then some shorter ones. The Broken Sword by Paul Anderson, who uh, is another famous name, and see these four columns of text? Those are all the things that Paul Anderson wrote. I guess he was a little bit prolific. Um, so this seems to be like a Norse Viking-inspired fantasy. We've got mentions of the sword Tyrfing, Thor, Yggdrasil, um, a human child kidnapped and raised by the elves, an ice giant etc. Um, I think I get the gist of that. Maybe I should describe it more, but I haven't read it and whatever. <laughs> um, then The Circus of Dr. Lau by Charles G. Finney. Um, this is a very old masterwork. This was originally published in 1935 and apparently it won uh, one of the very first National Book Awards. That's very interesting. Um, and this reminds me so much of the premise of Something Wicked This Way Comes by um, Ray Bradbury, because it is about a strange circus that arrives in a sleepy southwestern town during the Great Depression um, and changes the lives of the town's residents. And okay, <laughs> I sort of liked um, Ray Bradbury's kind of take on that. Um, we'll see about this one. Also, apparently it's been made into like a famous movie called Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, and I think I've actually heard of that one. And the last one is Grendel by John Gardner. This is apparently a retelling of Beowulf from the monster Grendel's perspective. And yeah, I guess it's a pretty famous work as well, kind of what Gardner might be known for. I honestly had never heard of uh, John Gardner before I looked this book up. Um, 
So I have actually read Beowulf many years ago, about half of my life ago, um, and I'm not sure if I really want to reread it before I go into this retelling. We'll see. Um, but it is relatively short, and I hope that I will like it. I, I don't actually remember what I thought about Beowulf. And now we're down to the last three things, um, which are the last three things that I bought. Um, uh, in October, uh, Small Beer Press had a 50% off sale for a couple of days, I think. Um, it was in celebration of Kelly Link getting a MacArthur Foundation grant. Um, Kelly Link and her husband run Small Beer Press. So I had to take the opportunity to get a couple of things, and uh, I ordered three things, I got two, and they accidentally sent me the wrong book for one of them, which, um, you know, it happens. <laughs> so um, I got the two that I was most interested in getting, so that is perfectly fine. The first one is The Serial Garden, The Complete Armitage Family Stories by Joan Aiken. I read another one of her collections, The People in the Castle, which is right up there, um, earlier this year, and I really liked it. I just, I loved the way that she wrote her stories for children, for adults, the, the vibe of them. They are um, fantasy blended with kind of the modern world, though it has kind of a, an older feel to it, like a world of the 1950s almost. Anyway, reading that collection just took me back to the way that I felt when I was reading stories when I was very, very young. I can't quite put that into words, but it's a very specific feeling and incredibly nostalgic. So um, I needed to get more by Joan Aiken, and I thought this would be an interesting one to pick up because it is um, the complete collection of stories she wrote about this Armitage family, um, a mother, a father, and their two children. And I've read the introduction and the first story, and it was it was a lot of fun. So I think this whole thing is going to be delightful. And uh, the other one is kind of a newer release. This is Terra Nullius by Claire G. Coleman. Um, Coleman is an Australian Aboriginal author, I believe, and this book kind of got shortlisted for a ton of Australian awards a year or two ago when it came out there. It's been published in the U.S. for the first time this year, I think. Um, so I noticed this first because the cover is totally my thing. I love the way that this book looks. Um, but it also sounds pretty interesting. I'm actually going to read the description from the pamphlet because that is a bit shorter. So this says, um, the natives of the colony are restless. The settlers are eager to bring peace to their new home and they have a plan for how to achieve it. They will tear native families apart and provide re-education to those who do not understand why they should submit to their betters. This is not Australia as we know it. This is not the Australia of our history books. This Terra Nullius is something new, but all too familiar. So I'm not entirely sure if this is speculative fiction or looking at history from a different perspective, um, but I'm, I'm very interested in whatever it may be and the sort of um, reflection of history in fiction and speculative fiction. So. I'm not sure what else to say about it than that, um, but yeah. And then this final book, um, I actually ordered a different book and they sent me the wrong one by accident, but sometimes, do you ever just feel like sometimes you get a book, the universe puts it in your hand and you should just not complain and just read it because why not? That's kind of how I feel about this. So um, the one they actually sent me has quite an interesting title. This is Skinny Dipping in the Lake of the Dead um, by Alan De Niro. It's a short story collection and I've never heard of it or the author, but I'm going to try reading it. Um, it says, these stories are both passionate and political, frequently funny, surreal, or slapstick. They also connect with readers on an emotional level in unexpected and surprising ways. Um, so I could really, really love this, uh, going into it blind, because I have enjoyed so much stuff published by Small Beer Press. They definitely um, are my type of thing. Um, on the other hand, they have published some uh, particular types of short story collections that I don't like, some sort of like slipstream short fiction, which is not really my thing. So we will find out what this one is. Wow, the end of this video is going to be really rough. I have just been interrupted multiple times by the male lady showing up, by the dog needing to go outside, just all the stuff. Um, so 
that is my September October book haul. Do let me know if you are interested in any of these books or if you have thoughts on them and if you've read them, if you think I should prioritize them, I would love to hear from you. Uh, sorry also if this video seems very rushed. I am actually in a rush right now. <laughs> but thank you so much for watching and I will talk to you again soon in another video and until then, bye.